We do have a very extensive and exciting study in front of us. Extensive because you're all aware, of course, of the size of the Kings and Chronicles and the prophets that have relationship to the Kings and Chronicles record. It's huge. And of course, we are only going to be able to touch on a few things in terms of the depth We're going to try and cover as much as we can of the breadth of the subject, but there will be times when we drill down, and we'll drill down for specific reasons. We're going to see that there are some wonderful prophecies in this record of Kings and Chronicles, as well as a lot of exhortations uh, for us along the way. And we're going to start really with the exhortations that come from the life of David, the legacy of David. Now, tomorrow morning I'm going to make a few comments about the way we will approach this, and the in terms of questions, I would encourage you, if you have questions, that you write them down so that at the end of the session we can address them. Please do that. Uh, For the sake of the recordings, we probably don't want to interrupt the flow of the classes too much, but if there's something that just has to be dealt with, then I'm happy for you to raise that matter during the class. But I would prefer if you would just write the question down. When I'm finished, and I'll finish whenever... I finish. In other words, it could be 30 minutes, it could be 40, it could be 50, it could be an hour. So when I'm finished and I'm done with the material, I will stop. And if there's time, we will answer your questions uh, after that. We're all familiar, aren't we, with this passage in Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, and that word thing in the Hebrew is Debar, and Debar is the Hebrew word that Yahweh chooses for his word. So it is the glory of God to conceal things that have relationship to the word, but the honour of kings is to search out, and that Hebrew word, Shekhar, means to penetrate, hence to examine intimately, and we're going to do a little bit of that in the course of our studies, examine intimately these things, a matter. And that word matter, again, is this word debar. So you might paraphrase Proverbs 25, verse 2 this way. It is the glory of God to conceal things in his word. And he does, doesn't he? You've got, to, you've got to work at it. You've got to dig around. You have to do a lot of digging in the word to uncover the secret things, the wonderful things that are contained therein. But it is the honour of kings... And we all know, of course, that we are being prepared to be kings and priests with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to consider the role of the kings of Israel and Judah. We're going to see that most of them failed. We don't want to duplicate their failure. We would rather duplicate the success of the few who did succeed. And there are secrets and keys about success in this matter of the leadership of God's people. And we're going to see that come out of our studies as we proceed, God willing. So it is the honour of kings to search out, to penetrate, to examine intimately the things that belong to the word of God. And that's why we're here. But of course you can mess it up. And Solomon did mess it up, as we're going to see. He wrote, under a pseudonym, in Proverbs 31, verses 3 to 5, these words. Give not thy strength unto women. Stop there. That was part of the reason of his failure, as we'll see in our second study this evening. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Those things that are intoxicating, which can befuddle the mind. And the world, of course, is full of that today. You don't have to go to a liquor store to have your mind befuddled. It could be befuddled by the things that the world is offering on a number of uh, levels. Entertainment levels, you know, the gadgetry levels that we have to deal with in this modern world. It says, not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law. And that's exactly what Solomon did. He forgot the law of his God, which he had copied out, handwritten out his, himself in great details. We, we shall look at that in our next study and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So you can mess it up, but it is a great honour for us to be able to open the word of God together and to explore these things which have been revealed only to those who are prepared to examine intimately the scriptures. Now, 
In our studies, we are going to be looking at a, a lot of kings. A lot of kings who... I'm hoping this is going to deliver the goods. A lot of kings who did not follow the example of David. Now, one of the things that I have done is that I've taken some selections out of the book that that study notes, the kings of Israel and Judah. Now, there's not too many of these, but I've done this because it's a fairly succinct way of summarising the character and life of a number of kings. And I've done that with David because of the importance of his legacy, what he left behind for other kings. So I'm going to read this out to you. Some of you will have already read these summaries in the books uh, on kings, but I think it will be helpful to us. We, we say, without any doubt, the beloved, as his name means, is the greatest figure in the period of Israel's history from the judges to the times of Christ. In the records of the kings, he is represented as a monumental figure who stood before, the, before Israel as Christ now stands before the ecclesia. His name is mentioned 70 times. Now that's very important because no one understood the purpose of God with the Gentiles better than David. And 70 just happens to be the number of the nations. He had a wonderful appreciation of God's purpose with the nations. His name is mentioned 70 times in the record under study, most frequently in the context of a comparison between his reign and that of his successors. He is set forth as the prime example of what Yahweh desired in a king, and consequently his character and reign became the standard by which all other kings were assessed. For example, 1 Kings 14 verse 8, 15, 3 to 5, we read, That he did that which was like David, his father. He did not that which was like David. They are compared to David. He becomes the the model on which other kings should have modelled themselves. But of course, David, like you and me, was not perfect. But he was a remarkable character. So why did Yahweh choose David when Saul, who had been selected for good reasons, which we can't explore now, but it's a, a, a wonderful subject in itself, why did God then choose David after the, after the removal of Saul? Says, Paul says in Acts 13 verse 22, And when he, God, had removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, and this of course is a quotation from Psalm 89 and verse 20, the psalm that deals with our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who would fulfil the covenants. He said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfil all my will. Now, what does he mean by that? A man after mine own heart. We need to note this fact, that this is more about David's understanding of divine principles and ways than about character. The next reference I'm going to give you is about his character. This is about his appreciation of divine principles and the divine purpose. So when you read this statement, a man after God's own heart, it is because David was the most spiritually intelligent man of the Old Testament. Now Brother Sargent once wrote, when he's writing about Matthew 5, 6 and 7, he wrote that David was the most God-conscious man of the Old Testament. He was also the most scripturally intelligent. Nobody came within a bull's roar of David's understanding of the divine plan and purpose, especially in relation to the covenants of promise and especially in relation to the inclusion of the Gentiles in the purpose of God. This is why he took the the, the rather pretentious step of taking the ark from kirjath Jerem and bypassing the tabernacle of Moses and putting it in a tent of his own making. Now, what temerity is that? But he doesn't put the ark back where it belongs. He did it purposefully. That the, that the Gentiles, men like Uriah the Hittite, for example, the, the, the thousands of Philistines who followed him out of the land of the Philistines when he became king, and what had become Christadelphians, he wasn't going to insist on them being circumcised. How could they worship Yahweh at the tabernacle, uncircumcised? They couldn't. 
And he understood. He understood the plan and purpose of God. That's why he acted as a Melchizedek king priest when the ark was taken up. He understood the inclusion of Gentiles. His mind on the things of God was greater than any other mind in the Old Testament, we believe. But what about his character? Well, Psalm 78, verses 70 to 72 address that. It says of Yahweh that he chose David, also his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according, and this is his character, he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So while that first reference there to in Acts 13, quoted from Psalm 89, is about David's comprehension of divine ways, this one is about his character. All right, can you see there, Chris? So it's about the characteristics of the man, his integrity, the skillfulness with which he dealt with the people, the way he had learnt to feed sheep, literal sheep, was now applied to the feeding of God's flock, the sheep of Israel. That's what that is telling us. He, le- he left an enormous legacy. His performance, though, like you and I, was not perfect. All right, he did make his mistakes. The record of 1 Kings 15 and verse 5 tells us one about the major one. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of Yahweh and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now, of course, we, we know all about that terrible crime of the adultery that was followed by deceit and by murder and by covering of sin for nine months. We know all about that. And, of course, it's a tragic time in the life of David, but he recovered from it. It took him a long time to recover from it, by the way. The record makes it clear that he didn't recover from it until the birth of Solomon. And Solomon was either number four or five in the family that David had through Bathsheba. We know that from the record of Scripture. So it was probably four or five years before David fully recovered from his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. In Micah 6 verse 8 we read this. He has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth Yahweh require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. David was such a man. One unforgettable but forgiven blemish marred David's distinguished record. And of course that record will go on forever even though it will not be mentioned to him, the sin of Bashi will not be mentioned to him at the judgment seat. Not one single word will be spoken by the angel at the judgment seat to David about his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. Not a word. It's been forgiven. It's been erased from the record. It's gone. Not to be mentioned. We know that from Ezekiel 18 and other places. And of course that's also going to be true of one called Manasseh. And we've been reading about him in our daily readings. Nobody did worse in corrupting God's people and murdering those who opposed him than Manasseh, the king of Judah. But he repented. He was forgiven. He will be in the kingdom. Providing, of course, after his forgiveness, he maintained a steady course. And there's nothing to suggest that he didn't. So he will be in the kingdom. That is the, that's the God we serve. Awful things came out of Manasseh's reign, as we're going to see in our studies. But he personally recovered himself. And so there's a great deal of encouragement in that for you and me. None of us perhaps are going to sin like David in committing adultery and murder. He could recover himself and he did. So can we. That's one of the things that will come out of our study in the kings of Israel. Because very, very few cases like that, by the way. Now I want to drill down a little bit into the life of David. We've given you the summary. You've heard all that before. Let's now drill down into a couple of passages. The first one, you see the one underlined there on the screen. You see an underlined passage, I want you to go straight to it if you wouldn't mind. First of Kings chapter 1.
This is the record, of course, of the last days of David. He's about to die. He, he has very poor circulation. They have to make provision for that. We read in verse 1 of, first of, of Kings chapter 1, now King David was old and stricken in years and they covered him with clothes but he got no heat. So he was on the way out. And of course we know they provided a by shag for him. And then you come to verse 33 and you read this. Verse 33, this is when of course Adonijah tries to usurp the throne uh, and Solomon uh, is uh, almost uh, you know, about to be killed because Adonijah is now in league with Joab and and, uh, and, the, and the priest uh, and they're going to Abiathar the priest and they're going to put Adonijah on, on the throne and of course we know what happens uh, David is informed of this but he can't do anything about it himself physically and you read in 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 33 the king also said unto them take with you the servants of your lord and cause Solomon my son to ride upon mine own mule and bring him down to Gihon and he gives instructions about Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointing Solomon as king. He goes on to, to, to say that ben in verse 36 said to the king, Amen, Yahweh, Elohim of my lord the king, say so too. And goes on to say in verse 38, Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and ben the son of Jehoiada and the Kerithites and the Pelethites, they're Philistines by the way, Kerithites and Pelethites, Philistines, loyal to David, right to the end, because of what he had done for them, bringing them into the truth, they went down and they caused Solomon to ride upon the king's mule. And of course it tells us then, they blew a trumpet and all the people said, God save the king. And all the people came up after him and the people piped with pipes and so on. That brought an end, of course, to Adonijah's attempt to assume the throne. So here was, here was the overthrow of trees. But did you notice that David, is, he's stuck to a bed he is stricken. He cannot get up and do anything about it himself. He has to give instructions to trusted men to do the job for him. Well, it all, it's all going to change. This occasion was fraught with confusion and division among the people, as verse 49 tells us. And all the guests of Adonijah that were with, with him were afraid and rose up and went every man his way. But when you come to the record of First Chronicles 28, you have a surprisingly different situation. So let's have a look at 1 Chronicles 28. We see how David was in 1 Kings 1. Weak, bed bound, unable to get up. All he could do was weakly give instructions to a few to, to get Solomon anointed. David would normally have been in the forefront of all of that. He didn't have the strength. He was about to die. But when you come to 1 Chronicles 28... There's a remarkable change here. Because you read in verse 1 these words. This is just before he dies. And David, notice this, and David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the captains of the companies that ministered the king by course, and the captains over the thousands and over the hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king, and of his sons with the officers and with the mighty men, and with all the valiant men under Jerusalem. So it's David that's doing this. Look at verse 2. Then David, the king, stood up upon his feet. Well, this is a remarkable revival, isn't it? Yes. You know why it's there? Because David's been resurrected, as it were. He's been almost dead. Good as dead. And now he appears before all Israel as a resurrected man. There's, there's strength given to this man. Now why do you think that would be the case? Well you see it's a type. And we're going to see a lot of types in the, book of, in the books of Kings and Chronicles. It's a type of the time when David will be resurrected to see his greater son, Christ, crowned king in fulfilment of 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 to 16 where he has promised that he's going to see his son upon the throne. He will see it with his own eyes. So this is the second coronation of Solomon. The first one was a hasty affair. This one is a well-organised affair. And it's typical of a greater one to come. 
So whereas, of course, Solomon uh, was uh, suggested in the words of, of 2 Samuel 7, he's not the one to whom David was looking. He was looking to the time when his greater son uh, would be made king in the presence of all Israel. So there, there is the reason why God gives sufficient strength to David to stand up on his feet. Now it's in this section that we learn a lot about David's mind and character and his concern for the ecclesia and the leadership that was going to be delivered to the ecclesia by his successor, Solomon. One of the things he does say in 1 Chronicles 29 verse 17, and there's a couple of chapters, 28, 29, that deal with this final few days of David's life. But he says in verse 17 of 1 Chronicles 29, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. So he dies, this man, with a happy heart. He sees the willingness of his people. He had spent the last few years of his life preparing the materials for the temple that Solomon was to build. He was not permitted to build it, but he made sure that everything was ready for it. And of course, that in our terminology is spending the last years of our life, so to speak, doing everything we can to prepare the house of God for its glorious future. That's the spirit of David at the end of his life, and so it should be ours. He was joyful because he witnessed Solomon's confirmation as king, his second coronation. He foresaw the fulfilment of the promises God had made to him. If you have a quick look at 1 Chronicles 28, verses 5 to 7, you read about that. In verse 5 he says, And of all my sons, for Yahweh hath given me many sons, He had chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of Yahweh over Israel. And he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. And of course he wasn't. Sadly, he wasn't. David had prepared the plans and materials for the temple, He tells us about that in 1 Chronicles 28, verses 11 to 19. We won't read that section. And again in chapter 29, verses 1 to 5, he enumerates all of the things that had been done. And he appeals in that section for the uh, willingness of the people to contribute to the temple. And he saw that willingness of the people. In 1 Chronicles 29, verses 6 to 9, we read about that. Verse 6 of chapter 29. Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of the thousands and of the hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly and gave for the service of the house of God of gold and all the things that are listed there that were to be used in that house. And it tells us in verse 9, Then the people rejoiced for they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to Yahweh And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. You know, if you want to experience joy, that's the way to get it. You want to to be happy, that's the way to get it. Give. Give liberally and willingly. God loves a cheerful giver, as you know. That's the principle that's being spelled out here. And when David saw that amongst his people, he rejoiced. He could die a happy man. But there was something else that made him joyful. 1 Chronicles 29, verses 10 to 20. We're not going to read that section, but this is what made him joyful. You have a look at what he says in, uh, in verse 13. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I? And what is my people? That we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort, for all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. He was joyful. Because he'd had this opportunity to praise and to thank his God. A wonderful occasion, isn't it? To see David resurrected, so to speak. To see the second coronation of Solomon. But in the course of the address that he gives in front of his people, 
he addresses some very important words to Solomon and to the people. And there are some key exhortations for kings of all ages. Certainly for kings in preparation for the kingdom of God. I want you to have a look with me at 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9. He turns to Solomon. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. That's the most important thing. Know thou the God of thy father. There's a need for personal, intimate knowledge of our God. To build a relationship with him. And serve him with with a perfect heart. Now I'm going to make something of this word perfect. You meet it quite frequently in the record of Kings and Chronicles. It is the Hebrew word shalem. It simply means to be complete. It is the root of shalem, which means to be safe. So the key ideas of this word are to, to be safe or therefore complete so that you can have confidence. There's a safety about this. That's the idea. It is the root of Solomon's name. Comes, his name comes from this word, Shalem. Sadly, he was not safe. We're going to make a little bit about this because it, it, it is a word that is, that is used of Solomon. It is also used of King Asa, one of his successors. And we're going to see how important it is. But David goes on to say this. And with a willing mind. The word willing here means a desiring mind. Some, you delight in something. You, you have pleasure in it. And the root of this Hebrew word is to in, means to incline towards something. And that's what God wants to see in his people, especially in their leaders. He wants to see this safety element where the things that they have been given, committed to their trust, are safe, so to speak, The relationship that they have with him is safe. He wants that, but he also wants this inclination. Now, we don't have a natural inclination towards divine things. We're simply not born with it. But it can be developed. It is something that can grow and develop in each one of us. He goes on to say this. Serve him with a perfect heart or a complete or a safe heart and with a willing mind. For Yahweh searcheth all hearts... And understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. As Rotherham translates that, he understands every devised purpose. In other words, every every purpose that we or every plan that we have, every intention that we have, he understands it. He sees it. And he sees that as an index to our character of what we really desire. Now David understood this. He's trying to get this message through to Solomon because he knows this is the key to success for kings. If thou seek him, he says, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. We're going to see this brought up in the life of King Asa in the record of 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 2, where this universal principle is laid out by our God to the kings of Israel and Judah. If you seek him, you will find him. But if you forsake him, he has no option but to forsake you until you turn back to him. That's the principle by which he operates. That's messed up, of course, in the modern world, the modern Christian world, isn't it? People say, oh, well, you know, God's unconditional love, it doesn't matter what you do. That's not what the scripture teaches. You seek him, you'll find him. You forsake him, He has no option but to forsake you until you turn back. So let's go on to the next key exhortation that David delivers in 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 20. Again he turns to Solomon. And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for Yahweh God, my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of Yahweh. While you're doing that work with a willing heart and you're committed to it, you can be guaranteed divine support 
Now this word strong, as you can see on the screen, is chazak. It means to seize. And hence, to, to have power over something, to be strong. And it implies, in this context, making firm and decisive decisions and commitments. And that's what David is encouraging Solomon to do. If you're going to be a builder of the house of God, if you're going to lead in any way his people, you're going to be a shepherd of his people, you want to be a king, well then this is the quality that you have to have. You have to have a commitment, a firm commitment. Seize the opportunities and be strong in them. This word good courage means to be strong, alert or courageous, to be bold. So the Rotherham translates it, be strong and bold and act. You get the idea of that? He's trying to get that message through to Solomon. And there are, of course, echoes. Echoes of David's words here, taken up, picked up from Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, when Yahweh committed the leadership of Israel to Joshua. Over and over again, he emphasises the need for Joshua to be strong and very courageous because the responsibilities of leadership are overwhelming sometimes. And there's not a lot, there's not a lot of uh, praise that comes when you have to lead, especially if you have to tell people they're not doing the right thing. And so it's a difficult, a difficult situation. But of course, if we're going to be leaders of the age to come, then we need to have these qualities being developed in our lives today. Verse 21 goes on to say this. And behold, the courses of the priests and the Levites, even they shall be with thee for all the service of the house of God. And there shall be with thee for all manner of workmanship every willing, skilful man. Willing, skilful man. The word willing, as you can see on the screen, nadib means voluntary, generous, spirited. So we know the principle that Paul spells out in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, that God loves a cheerful giver, and that's the spirit that David is encouraging in Solomon and indeed in all his people. Well, that's all I'm going to say in relation to David's last words there. But I do want to turn to his last written words in, in 2 Samuel 23. And I'll take you there, and I'll lead you there by, by emphasising the importance of David as a prophet. He was a prophet in many ways, wasn't he? He wrote scripture that is prophecy. But he was also a prophet as a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was a prophet of the words that Christ would speak and the thoughts that Christ would think. And that's what Peter tells us. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Peter says, when he's talking about the salvation that's in Christ, he says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now, he has in mind many of the Old Testament writers, but in particular, he has in mind David. You know why? Because he talks about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. They're the two keys of the kingdom. All right? That's the keys of the kingdom. And Psalm 22 is the psalm that David wrote that's got nothing to do with his experience because it's all about crucifixion. David knew nothing about crucifixion. It's talking about what happens you know, when the body is extended and the, you, your bones are all sticking out and your heart stops to beat. All that sort of stuff. David never went through that. But Psalm 22 is divided up into two sections. This is 1 to 21a partway through verse 21 is the sufferings of Christ in great detail so that Christ knew exactly what his experience was going to be on the cross exactly and then from 21b to the end of the psalm verse 31 is about the glory that would follow it's the two keys of the kingdom so when Peter uses that language there He's taking us back to Psalm 22 and other writings of David 
where David expresses the thoughts, the feelings and the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would ultimately come because of his suffering. He was above all others the voice of Messiah in matters pertaining to his suffering and glory. So come with me to 2 Samuel 22 and 23. And we're going to finish off on this. Now, what I'm not going to do, brethren, here is give you an exposition. I'm going to give you the slides. And what you'll see when you get the slides is that I'm only going to give an overview of 2 Samuel 22, 23, especially the latter. But then there are a number of slides which give you the detail. They're a little bit like Bible marking slides in a way. They give you the detail of the wonderful prophecy of David concerning Christ, his sufferings and his glory, right at the end of his life. So let's just come along and have a look at 2 Samuel 22 and 23. Now you're all aware, of course, that 2 Samuel 22 is a list of great things that had happened in the life of David. It steps through the life of David. It says in verse 1, David spake unto Yahweh the words of this song in the day that Yahweh delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies. And so you get a list, a long list, of the way that God had worked in this man's life. And this, of course, is repeated elsewhere. These two chapters are not in chronological order. They are structured to form a picture of the final fulfilment of the promises that God made to David. So the list of mighty men which you find, if you have a look at 2 Samuel 23, the list starts in verse 8, goes through to the end of the chapter, and of course it's significant, isn't it, that the very last of the mighty men is Uriah the Hittite. Now he's been dead for at least 25 years. I mean, Solomon is the fifth son of Bathsheba, and he's reigning at age 20, so, you know, minimum... Minimum 25 years, probably longer. Uriah's been dead for 30 years. But he's in this list. And so are others who have long since been dead. So this, this list, you see, is not a list made up at the end of the life of David. This is a list of his mighty men through his reign. Now, what's it there for? Well, it's there, placed at the end, to typify the immortals who will make up the army of our Lord Jesus Christ, the mighty men of our Lord Jesus Christ, the greater beloved. That's why it's in that position. Now, in 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 and 8, it's David himself who heads the list as the type of Christ. And then you have gradations of saints according to achievement and honour. That's why you read that there are three prominent. You have a look at verse 8. About two-thirds, three-quarter way through the verse, you read of a man called Adino the Esnite. What do you know about him? Not much. What you're told here. But he is in the top three of the mighty men of David. He's accompanied in verse 9 by a man called Eleazar, the son of Dodo the Ahoite. Then the third one in verse 11 was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Hararite. Now these three men, of course, did some quite remarkable things. They proved themselves to be mighty men. And so they, they're at the head of the list. And it's there because, you see, in the kingdom age, there will be gradations of authority among the saints. Have thou authority over ten cities, says the parable, remember? Have thou authority over five cities? We know, just as it is with the angels, that there are angels who are at the head of the echelon, And then you step down to those of lower status in the scheme of things. So it will be in the kingdom age. You know, the the, the two disciples and their mother who came and said, let us sit on the right and left. He said, well, hang on, hang on. That's not mine to give at this stage. He will give it because he knows who it is now. There will be right and left who sit with our Lord Jesus Christ. I know where, if I'm there by the grace of God, I know where I'm going to be, right down the end of the line, okay? Probably with most of you. Because we wouldn't put ourselves any higher, would we? That's where we'll be. But, but look, I, I just want to be there. I don't mind if I'm last on the list. Are you? Do you? No, I don't think you mind at all. I, I, don't, I want to be on the list of the mighty men. 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this record is structured to give us the encouragement to continue through the difficulties of life because some of these men are long since dead. They're dead because of certain things. In the case of Uriah, he's murdered. Right? But he was faithful to that point. He remains in the list. So what have we got here? We've got 2 Samuel 22, which is David's psalm of thanksgiving, this long list. He celebrates his triumphs over all his enemies, verse 1. This psalm has deep roots in Genesis 14. If you go through it, you sift through it. Deep roots in Genesis 14 and the things that surround Melchizedek, Abraham Melchizedek, and the language of the Most High and so on. Deuteronomy 32, which is about Armageddon and the setting up of the kingdom. So Melchizedek, Armageddon, Ael Aelion all make their appearance, showing the mind of David. He had an unbelievable understanding of these things. But there's another theme in it. There are many themes in it. And one of them is the producing of children from both Jew and Gentile. That too is drawn from Deuteronomy 32. And the use of the divine title Zer, the rock, comes out. Rocks and stones and children are right throughout this this psalm of David. Why would that be the case? Well, because it's drawn from Deuteronomy 32. Now the one thing about rocks is that they don't change very much, do they? Each rock has its own character. It doesn't change very much. And Yahweh is described as a zur, a mighty boulder. He has character. And in Deuteronomy 32, you know what he says? He looks at the children of Israel and he says, you don't look like me at all. You're not my children. You don't come from the old rock. So what does Isaiah 51 say? Look unto the rock from whence ye are hewn. Yeah, you got the idea? So David's mind is in that particular field. This psalm is prophetic of Christ's final triumph over all flesh. Have a look, for example, 2 Samuel 22, verses 44 to 51. See if you can line this language up with David. Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. Thou hast kept me to be head, head of the heathen or nations. A people which I knew not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid out of their close places. And so on it goes like that. This is language of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what it says there in verse um, in verse 45? Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. If you have the same margin as my Bible, it says, Yield feigned obedience. This is what will happen immediately after Armageddon. When nations like Britain and America and Canada and nations like that will come along and say, we submit. They won't come along and say, we want to be Christadelphians. This is based upon what happened in Joshua chapter 9, when the Gibeonites came along and said, make a league with us. They did not want to become Christadelphians. They just wanted to survive. And that will be the way. They will come with a faint heart. And Christ will say, yes. I'll accept your submission, but you will become Christadelphians. You see these people over here? They're my king priests, and some of them are going to go with you, and you'll end up being converted. So that's what's going to happen. So this language didn't apply to David in his day. It is language that can only apply to our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's conclude by giving you a summary of the first seven verses of 2 Samuel 23. I'm going to use the translation by Brother Thomas to give you the overview. He does really get down to the Hebrew. This is how you can follow it through in in the authorised, if that's what you have, and see how he changes because of the Hebrew Hebrew that uh, he understands here. Changes things that are quite significant. Now these words of David, the last, are an oracle of David, son of Jesse. Even an oracle of the mighty man enthroned. So David is set forth as a type of Christ. Concerning an anointed one of the Elohim of Jacob. You see, it's not about him. It's about the one he points to, Christ. And the pleasant theme of Israel's songs. So this one who is to come is the pleasant theme of Israel's songs. And that's quite different from what you read in the AV. Because the AV says, And the sweet psalmist of Israel said, It's like... This is what David is saying. No, it's not about David. It's about whom David represented in type. 
It's about our Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say this, in Brother Thomas's translation, he says, Yahweh's spirit spake by me, and his word was upon my tongue. Elohim of Israel spake to me, and the rock of Israel discoursed, saying, There shall be a ruler over mankind, ruling in the righteous precepts of Elohim. Do you see what that says in verse 3? The AV says, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. That's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, There shall be a ruler over mankind, ruling in the righteous precepts of Elohim. And as brightness of morning, he shall rise the sun of an unclouded dawn, shining forth after rain upon tender grass out of the earth. And David says, Though my house is not so with ale, yet he hath appointed for me the covenant of the Olam, that is of the millennial period, the hidden period, ordered in everything and sure, truly this is all my salvation and all my delight, though he cause it not to spring forth. But the wicked shall be all of them as a thorn bush to be thrust away, yet without hand shall they be taken. In other words, it will be a divine act. With our hand shall they be taken. And then we conclude with his reference to the sufferings of Christ. Nevertheless, he says, a man shall smite them. He shall be filled with iron and the shaft of a spear, which he was by the Roman soldier, but with fire to burn up while standing, they shall be consumed. The events of AD 70. So they would crucify their own Messiah and suffer the judgments of AD 7. David saw all of that. His last words reveal his absolute conviction in the promises that God had made. He expresses his confidence in the sure mercies of David. The, the arrival finally on the scene of this one who are being filled with iron, hands and feet, filled with iron, having a spear struck into him, Forthwith coming blood and water, he foresaw the time when the promises of God would be made sure and the sure mercies of David would ultimately be fulfilled. We're going to leave it there and in our next session we'll have a look at the law of the king and the failure of Solomon and the tragedy of the division of the kingdom.